Hey everyone, welcome to another Ask GN. As always, leave your questions in the comment section below for next week's episodes. We're shooting three today. One is going to be on the Patreon available side of things. So you go to patreon.com slash gamersaccess to help out and get access to that extra episode, bonus episode. The other two will be here on the main channel. We're going to publish them pretty close to each other within 18 hours or so. And uh, we have several good ones for this. GT1030 follow-up questions, mostly legal ones, and uh, questions about not all gigahertz being created equal, things like that. Also a really fun flow question for fans. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermaltake's View 37 case. The View 37 focuses on highlighting custom PC builds with its full panoramic window and tinted front acrylic. In our thermal testing, the View 37 performed reasonably well when considering its looks-focused build, which is partly thanks to the airflow design and the removal of a bottom power supply shroud. For a balance of looks and performance, check the link in the description below for the View 37. Before we get into the first question, as I noted in the other episode that's going live, this shirt, we've almost sold through all of them already. So we're going to be closing pre-orders in about a week when we run out of our inventory that we've ordered. If you want one, get your order in now on store.gamersnexus.net. It's a limited edition shirt, foil print shirt of our 10 year anniversary GN teardown logo design. Once they're gone, they're gone. We're not gonna make this shirt again, ever. So uh, the pre-order is closed in about a week if you wanna get it, get it now. First question is from Dr. Guns for Hands, who has one of my favorite names. Uh, I think this was on the Patreon Discord. Dr. Guns for Hands says, just watched the GT1030 video, and I have a question that I'd actually like to di direct at the lawyer guy you had on about the NVIDIA NDA, if he's willing to. Would having these two different products, this is referring to the GT1030 with GDDR5 and the 1030 with DDR4, would having these two different products that perform wildly different to the tune of 2X in some cases with the same branding and hiding the differences in the product number constitute a misrepresentation of the product by FCC, I think probably you mean FTC, guidelines and be a deceptive practice that they could end up on the hook for. Uh, so first thing, uh, yeah, F FTC and FCC get confused all the time. It's FTC that would handle something like that. And the answer, I think, very briefly is no. I don't think there is going to be a legal problem there. So obviously, we as a media outlet take issue with the GT1030 DDR4 and GDDR5 cards. The fact that they exist with the same name and have such hugely different performance is something we didn't like. And we said that in the video and made it all very clear and all that stuff. The GDDR5 version is actually a decent, pretty good performer for the price, but the DDR4 one is awful. And it actually wouldn't be such a big deal if it didn't have the same name, as I said before, because, I mean, then it'd just be, it'd just be a low-performing card for display out. But having the same name is what makes it misleading, as you said, and I absolutely agree. It is, it is definitely misleading now. I am obviously not a lawyer. I have spoken with two, but, uh, but I, I had a pretty good feeling I could answer this question even without talking to them. I did get some, some legal oversight, though, just to answer your question as best I can. So my feeling, and, and the one that the lawyers we spoke with basically confirmed, was that although it is kind of a uh, just a not great business practice and potentially misleads consumers to buying their own card. Although those points stand, I don't think this is necessarily a legal problem, and here's why. Ultimately, it, what, is the, uh, what is the phrase, caveat emptor? It's all buyer beware. Everything is on the spec page. So it says DDR4, it says DDR4 somewhere in the name, even if it's kind of like a weird serial number, basically, that a consumer might not understand, but it's there. And it's in the spec sheet. So really they've done, I think, the legal requirement to disclose what the thing is. And you look at other companies do this all the time, like SSD companies, they change components yearly for the same SSD. So you might buy the same for uh, actually some memory. There's a reason a lot of these companies, motherboards too, VRMs, will sometimes will ask, this is more true for low-end components than high-end. So a lot of the time with low-end budget components, we'll ask like, what VRM are you using? Uh, what NAND are you using? Or what memory dies are you using? And they will often, the companies will say something to us to the effect of like, well, we can't answer that. And of course, my response for years was always, but I can open it and find out. So why don't you just save us all the time and tell me? And the reason I finally got an answer from someone on that, because I would open them and I would find out. And someone finally told me, actually, it's because, uh, because it's such a 
budget component, we might change suppliers on that stuff. And as long as it performs within probably their rough guidelines, they're fine with changing suppliers, but they don't like to make a hard claim on what's in there because it might change. So anyway, that's kind of a different issue, but that kind of stuff happens all the time though, and you don't see lawsuits over those normally. Uh, but anyway, then that's because they, they define a spec, like maybe IOPS or maybe um, memory frequency and timings. And as long as they meet the frequency and timings, then they've done what they need to do to meet that because they weren't promising a certain type of memory die. They weren't promising Samsung B die or whatever. But anyway, this is clearly different because this is an instance where there are two products, not one, and they have pretty close names. But yeah, I, to answer it, Again, I am not a legal expert. Uh, I have spoken with some, and but I, yeah, I, I think this is really a non-issue in a legal sense. In a moral sense, I think it's a problem, and I don't like it. But uh, I don't think we're going to see Nvidia drag through a lawsuit over the GT 1030. It could be wrong. You can sue anyone. You don't have to be right or win or anything. But I don't. I don't expect it. Um, it's a little bit. It's different from like the GTX 970 practices because this is, uh, it's disclosed. It's just up to you to figure that out, which again, although uh, shitty, I guess, is not illegal. So next question is for, uh, and, and thanks to uh, our lawyer friends who helped out with that. Next question, low spec action squad <laughs> said, uh, hey, I've got a question for Ask Jen. Can you perhaps give some insight to the old adage, not all gigahertz are created equal? Uh, I deal in older hardware a lot and can 100% confirm that sometimes a slower processor will outperform a higher clock counterpart. I know that some of this comes down to cache size, yes, uh, but how does the actual IPC compare between generations and, if possible, between product lines? Are there any instances of modern processors where the older generation or a specific older part compared to its specific newer counterpart would be a genuinely better choice? It's a great question. A uh, good example of this is how the later generation 1 GHz Pentium 3 processors would outperform the early 1.3 GHz Pentium 4 CPUs despite P4 having higher clock speeds. Yes, uh, so that's certainly one of them. The next one I would point to is probably Phenom 2. Phenom 2 was a crazy good processor, Phenom 2 X4, and it's unfortunate that it had to deal with Nehalem or, or Sandy or whatever came out right around it. We talked about it in our Phenom 2 revisit that we did. It's unfortunate because Intel kind of came out of nowhere almost with massive improvements to Sandy Bridge and the Halem was pretty good. Uh, but Phenom 2 X4 was a great, or was it X6? I think it was X6, wasn't it? Uh, sorry, my memory, it's, it's a long time ago now. I think it might have been X6. Either way, the point is Phenom 2, X whatever. Phenom 2 was really good and it was better than Bulldozer in a lot of instances. Uh, I think IPC was better on Phenom 2. Uh, and... I'm, I'm pretty sure it was versus the original Bulldozer launch. Bulldozer was pretty messy when it first came out uh, and later on in life for that instance, but uh, literal Bulldozer, I don't just mean like the name people use as kind of the overarching name for FX. I mean like literal, the first Bulldozer processor was bad. And Phenom 2 is better than it in a lot of instances. So I would say that's a great example of what you're talking about. Other ones, I'm sure there are other examples. That's kind of the one that sticks in my mind. Um, I'll think about it and let you know if I come up with another one. But that's probably the, that's the best one I have. Yours is pretty good too. Uh, other than that, so some spe specific examples you're talking about, I guess these are counterparts, but not from the same company. Um, this is addressing your not all gigahertz are created equal. The best example of this is different architectures. So uh, same architecture, like. Ryzen, Ryzen 2, or whatever, they will share basically all of the core features that make Zen the Zen architecture. But if you're looking at different architectures, you have things like you said, cache size is a big one. It depends ultimately on the kinds of things you're processing. So if you're doing something that is really thrashing the cache, then having a, uh, a, a superior cache on one architecture versus the other would lead into that adage of not all gigahertz are created equal. Because if it's cache thrashing and just hitting constantly, then having a faster cache or a bigger L1, anything that's closer to the CPU will be helpful. Um, you talk about like L1, L2, L3 cache, it's kind of, it's basically named like how close in proximity physically is it to the CPU. So uh, different cache sizes for each of those will impact performance in great ways, not necessarily contingent on the frequency as much as just like the cache 
physical proximity to the cores and, and the size of the cache and speed of the cache. So that's one example. Uh, Intel, when Ryzen 1 launched, was about 7.5% ahead in IPC. This is something AMD said, even. Um, so that's an example of where they had an IPC lead. Uh, Intel's Ryzen 2 caught up in a lot of ways, but Ryzen 1, there was about a 7.5% difference there. So that's an example of where uh, clock for clock, you still had an instructions per clock lead with Intel at the time. Obviously, the threaded, multi-threaded performance is a different story. And another example of not all gigahertz being created equal, because if you have a low frequency processor with a ton of threads, then uh, that frequency is going to be less of an impact on things that care about threads, like Blender or something like that. And frequency matters more for things like Premiere. But ultimately, just having straight frequency if the rest of the architecture doesn't line up, doesn't matter a whole lot because if you have eight threads or eight cores at five gigahertz versus four, but the process, the product only uses four, then it doesn't really matter. The product in this case being like Adobe Premiere, I mean software product. Uh, so that's an example. Another one, I took a couple notes here, let's see. Uh, yeah, so IPC I would say is more deserving of a standalone video. We might do that, I'll talk to some people. Uh, bottlenecking is also interesting here. So take Vega or Titan vGPUs, where on both of those you use HBM, but uh, the HBM is kind of, on Vega, is a major bottleneck point. So as, as you overclock the core more and more, again, not all gigahertz create equal, you keep pushing the core, maybe you push it another 50 megahertz or something like that. At some point, major diminishing returns are hit if you're not also increasing the HBM clock in most gaming applications. Not everything, but most gaming. So in that instance, it's a case where you can keep pushing the frequency, but at some point, having a frequency that's 50, 15, whatever, 100 megahertz higher than uh, the choke point on memory, it becomes irrelevant. And that's because the memory is now the bottleneck, and uh, that's just because Vega architecture happens to be very memory bandwidth intensive. You look at the GT1030, this is another great example. So let's talk about this one. I set the GT1030, uh, is this GDDR5? Uh, I think this is the G5 card. I set the GT1030 with GDDR5 to the same frequency as the one with DDR4, core frequency. And uh, even with the same core frequency, it was a massive difference, like 50% differences with the uh, GDDR5 card being faster. So you're talking 2x performance from baseline DDR4 card at the same core frequency, and that loss is because of the memory bus and because of the memory bandwidth, which is derived from the memory bus and the memory speed. So that's another great example of the core frequency gigahertz not being equal because ultimately you ran into some other barrier. And I am not uh, an expert on like really low level architecture. I'd love to be, but it's, it's you know, I kind of, I know my place and uh, I've been focusing on obviously learning as much as I can, but a lot of my job is talking to people who know more than me and getting their insight and sharing it with you. So what I plan to do is hopefully someday we'll, I've got some experts in mind who are brilliant and we'll talk to them about IPC specifically so I can expand on that in a more uh, competent and collected way. But I hope those examples help answer your question. Next one, GGCHB gig GHB says, uh, which moves more air? One fan, speaking of experts, one fan at 1500 RPM or two at 750 stacked together or in side-by-side -side config? What about noise and energy efficiency? What if the front fan is slower than the rear fan when stacked like in jet engines? So I'm pulling out my phone for a reason here. I did speak to someone about this. Uh, so this is a fun question. Basically, let me boil it down to this. If we have two fans side-by-side -side that are 350 LPM, linear feet per minute of flow, versus one that's 700, is there a difference in how much air is actually going into the case? Uh, we kind of have to do the physics thing of like assume a spherical cow. Uh, we have to assume a whole lot of things here. Like we're ignoring that the case impacts airflow. We're ignoring a lot of things. Let me read a response on this from VSG from Thermal Bench. VSG is one of our experts we speak with. He works, uh, he he runs the Thermal Bench website. It has great resources for open loop testing that's, and fan testing as well, which we've been talking to him about fan testing too. So I would encourage you to check it out. But he said, uh, feel free to paraphrase. I won't, I'm just gonna read it. But honestly, it comes down to the specific fan and airflow restriction in play. 
the PQ curve of fans isn't linear, and airflow restriction is certainly not so. For higher restriction applications such as radiators, it is possible that a single fan at 2000 RPM will fare better than two fans in push-pull at 1000 RPM, and this is assuming other things, uh, effective fin pitch and airfield combination, are not a big factor. To give you an example, I had tested this with the Corsair H75 AIO. It came with two fans, so I used one first and then both in push-pull, and VSG gave me one of his graphs we can share with you from his website. Uh, so these graphs are a little, little complex. There's a lot going on, but they are extremely helpful and detailed. PWM signal percent is on the bottom, and uh, then the rest of the data on the sides, RPM on the left, and uh, let's read the rest of his response. He said, for a less restrictive application, Two fans and push-pull will generally have lower noise for the same amount of air pushed through, all other things being equal. So that's why it was popular to do so with water cooling back when radiators were optimized for high airflow and performance. Now that operating noise has become a priority in other regions than just Europe, radiators are designed differently. So push-pull is a waste of money unless it's an aesthetic choice or you are absolutely limited by radiator space. Side-by-side -side versus push-pull can't really be compared since the airflow field is different. So hopefully that helps you out, and that goes back into what I was saying about talking with experts. VSG does great work. Uh, I, I would encourage you to check out that chart. You rewind it if you need to. It's, it answers your question pretty damn well. Next question is from L01, or LOL, I guess. Uh, E101 it says, how is the thermal conductivity of the foil, you oh, this is for the shirt, of the foil you use? I would like my shirt to conduct heat away from my body. Also, do you think the KB Lake R mobile CPUs were an effect of Ryzen as well as impending Ryzen mobile? Uh, conductivity of the foil we use, I'm not sure. Maybe we can get Snowflake to test it. She's the one who oversees our testing operations, so I'll, I'll certainly uh, ask her if we can <laughs> scrape some of it and find out what the thermal conductivity is using some high-end uh, thermal conductivity testing solution. As far as the question, the real question, I suppose, or the secondary question, because let's face it, this shirt is pretty awesome and you should consider picking one up on store.gamersnexus.net. Next question, do you think the KB Lake R mobile CPUs were an effect of Ryzen as well as impending Ryzen mobile? KB Lake R, uh, the whole, everything to do with AMD and Intel right now is really interesting. So first, let me say this. I think Hades Canyon, which is them working together, uh, was a, a really big kind of warning shot to NVIDIA. NVIDIA dominates that low end sort of uh, like, not even low end, just let's call it HTPC devices. Look at Zotac. Those small PC boxes, almost universally, they've used NVIDIA mobile GPUs or modern NVIDIA desktop GPUs now that they've gotten rid of the M suffix. The laptops pretty much all use NVIDIA GPUs. They have like 90 plus percent market dominance for GPUs, non-Intel ones in laptops. And so Hades Canyon, I, I honestly think, scared NVIDIA quite a bit. And seriously, I, I do think it was a concern of theirs. And that, I think, was a response from Intel and AMD to NVIDIA. So kind of different part of the question of, uh, of NVIDIA's market dominance. And Intel doesn't particularly like NVIDIA and vice versa. So I would say that Hades Canyon and that product is a, a response to NVIDIA. Now, uh, KB Lake R, mobile CPUs, things like that, I would say yes. I do think that Intel, in general, not even just with this product, but in general, is responding to AMD. It's, it's really exciting to see. We haven't seen this kind of action in the CPU market in a long time. So yes, uh, other examples of Intel responding to AMD. So one thing here, before I get into that, when people talk about like, this is a response to X. First, keep in mind that a lot of the products we see, silicon especially, are in development for years. So like even just a case, some of those take two years to make. So if you have a, two cases launched that are pretty similar to each other, maybe five months apart, just remember the second one might have still been in development two years ago, and they may have never known about it until the other one launched. And the same goes for silicon, for CPUs and GPU products. And so there are responses, but uh, for things that kind of launched immediately after Ryzen, like Coffee Lake, Coffee Lake as an architecture is not a response to Ryzen. It was going to happen. But what I think is a response is things like uh, the stack in terms of pricing for how many cores you get or marketing, especially gigantic response there. And the bigger thing that Intel's done 
is pull in all of their launch schedules. X299 was supposed to launch at least a month later than it did, three weeks to, to longer. And they pulled that into Computex of whatever year that was last year, I guess. And that was a response to Threadripper, absolutely. The 28 core CPU that was shown off uh, prematurely, that was a response to Threadripper 2. Coffee Lake, the, you might remember the low-end platforms, non-Z, were not launched with the Z series. They were launched later, and that's because the Z series was pulled in with 8700K and 8600K, I think, and those were launched ahead of time as a resp response to Ryzen gaining popularity for high thread count users. Uh, so those are the responses. Now, architecturally, I would say sort of late this year and next year might be when we start seeing the beginnings of architectural responses, not just like marketing and pricing and timeline responses. So uh, hopefully that, that gives some insight. I think we'll also see changes for Spectre and Meltdown and stuff, obviously. But uh, the answer is yes. I think there are responses, but just remember that architecturally, that stuff, it, it can be years. So they're probably pretty locked in by the time the stuff is shipping for a long time at that point. They're just doing fine tuning. And uh, there still can be responses, but a lot of them are going to be less uh, physical to the hardware itself. Next one, Ziv Zoolander says, if I put six Noctua NF A12 25 fans in a Corsair 280X, will the build collapse into a black hole? Time sensitive question. Please respond. Next question, Knight Rider 21 says, Hi Steve, you guys talk about overclocking, but does it make sense to buy an unlocked CPU to undervolt and save on noise? I haven't actually tried this in a while, but a lot of the unlocked CPUs I've worked with, like in laptops, you can still undervolt them. So I don't know that you actually need one to undervolt. It's more of the, the ratio that gets unlocked and the base clock. So uh, I don't think you have to buy an unlocked CPU. If someone has tried recently, please correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, but um, last I tried was seventh gen and I could still undervolt below stock just fine. And I think that same was true for eighth gen. But anyway, uh, is it worth it? Yeah, if you want it to be quieter, the way it would work is you drop the voltage, so then you can drop the fan speed significantly and then, uh, then it can be pretty damn quiet if you don't want to just invest a lot of money in trying to silence like with quieter fans or bigger cooling radiators, whatever. So yeah. Uh, well, I, I would say no. It's not worth buying an unlocked CPU for that purpose. It is worth buying a CPU and undervolting it because I think you can do that anyway. Um, and it's, like I said, like you said, we mostly do overclocking, so not something I try a whole lot. But yes, I think, pretty sure on most platforms, there's no problem with doing that as long as the BIOS permits it. Because uh, it's not like it's going up, it's going down. So yeah, it's worth undervolting to reduce thermal noise. Next one, this name is awesome. Bamf Hammer says, would a monoblock add more heat into the system and possibly reduce cooling components that matter if the system is small? It's gonna depend on the size of your cooling solution. The more liquid there is, uh, the more that heat's going to be spread out. It will ultimately, yes, impact things. So a great example of this with thermal data we've tested. It's not a literal monoblock, but it's pretty damn close. We tested like it was the FTW3 or the Gigabyte card or whatever, one of the Water Force cards, where they had a copper cold plate. It hits the GPU and it expands out and hits all the GDDR modules. And some of them expand out further and go to the VRM. It's a great way to cool all of those components with liquid without actually having water flowing through blocks. But it does increase the GPU core temperature. And the same thing applies here to what you're talking about. So just just translate what I'm saying to CPUs. But uh, we did a test with a cold plate on the GPU, and then we did a test with adding the expansion plate to cover the VRM and the GDDR memory, and the GPU temperature went up, we'll call it, but that's because the cooling solution is shared with more components. So it's dealing with more heat. You might have like, say, I don't know, uh, 100 watts, 150 watts of heat or something like that coming off of a silicon uh, processor and then you might have another eight watts of heat coming off the VRM or 15 or some low amount. And as long as your thermal solution can handle it, uh, it's not that much of a hike and it can be a, a, a benefit for the other components. Things like GPUs, um, the trouble is that they are more frequency sensitive to thermals, so an extra five degrees can matter there. But with a CPU, 
if you increase your sea view temperature by a couple degrees because you are now sinking the VRM as well, it's not normally a big deal unless you're already like in the 90s. So uh, the answer is yes, it will impact it, but maybe not meaningfully. I think we have two more quickly. Uh, let's see, Space Jam Flam. Hey, Buildzoid and Steve. And Buildzoid's new, how to safely apply liquid metal to Thane's video. You use the motherboard mounting bracket as your only retention method for the IHS, so no glue or anything. Do you think this is an adequate long-term solution for me? It would be on Coffee Lake, horizontally mounted in the case. Uh, yes, the answer is yes. That bracket is, we, we do the same thing. I almost never put adhesive on delitted components because it kind of eliminates half the point of delitting them because you're introducing a gap now. So I actually try to, I avoid adhesive unless I'm shipping it to someone. Like if I ship a loose processor out to another YouTuber who wanted us to delit it for them, I'll seal it. Normally with crazy glue or something. But otherwise I don't. And that's because the, the clamping force on that socket is significant. And then you're gonna put a cooler on top of it. So that thing's not gonna move. Uh, it, is, it will not move. So I, I would not worry about that aspect of things. Uh, next question, last question. Tam Drain says, you really got me with the get it before it's gone forever. At the end there, supreme marketing skills, Steve, ordering one and a mod mat. Thank you very much for picking up the mod mat. Our next round, some of you have been asking. Uh, it is it, almost here. So email support at gamersaccess.net if you need an update on that. But we're pushing them to ship them end of this week as of filming. So that would be a week of the 4th. Uh, so end of this week, we're hoping they start shipping to us and we can distribute them. Thank you for picking one up. And thank you for grabbing the limited edition foil shirt. You can get it at store.gamersnexus.net. Get the other episode on the main channel. We filmed two main episodes. They are both pretty good. Uh, you can get the bonus episode on patreon.com slash gamersnexus. And subscribe for more as always. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.